Good morning from Oslo, good evening to Japan, and greetings to those of you tuning in from other locations around the world. Welcome to today's webinar, Ocean Governance, Sustainability and Security Seen from Japan and Europe, hosted by NUPI, the Norwegian Institute of International Affairs. My name is Ren Yanni Lingren, and I am a Senior Research Fellow here at NUPI, and I will be chairing today's seminar, which is hosted under the auspices of our Center for Ocean Governance. The aim of today's webinar is to discuss the future safeguarding and sustainability of the oceans by considering some of the core ocean governance challenges, such as illegal, unreported, and unregulated fishing, and to reflect on how to strengthen ocean-related cooperation. Our two speakers will cover broad geographic space spanning from the Indo-Pacific to the Arctic, and their presentations will highlight common themes, and we will have a chance to discuss them as well. Before I briefly introduce our speakers, I would like to mention that this webinar is being recorded and it will be posted on NUPI's YouTube channel for further access after the webinar. The seminar will run for approximately one hour and 15 minutes. We will have presentations from our two speakers and then we will have the opportunity for a question and answer session. And the question and answer session will be done through the Teams Q&A chat function. So I would like to encourage you, the audience, to please submit your questions throughout the webinar. You can do this at any time, during the presentations, during the Q&A, whenever they pop into your head, any questions, please submit them and we will make sure to take them up in our Q&A session. But for now, I would like to introduce our two speakers. We have two distinguished speakers tuning in from different parts of the globe. And our first speaker today is Captain Kentaro Furuya who is an adjunct professor at the National Graduate Institute for Policy Studies, also known as GRIPS, in Tokyo, Japan, and a professor at the Japan Coast Guard Academy. He has served as a Coast Guard officer for over 30 years, dedicating his career to maritime safety and security at the scene and to the formulation of policy on shore. Professor Furia was appointed as a member of the Japanese delegation to the International Maritime Organization, and teaches the Maritime Safety and Security Policy Program at GRIPS, which is a collaborative program between GRIPS and the Japan Coast Guard. He holds master's degrees from the World Maritime University and the University of Greenwich. Our second speaker is Dr. Andreas Raspotnik, who is a senior research fellow at the Fritjof Nansen Institute, also known as FNI, located here in Oslo, and an Austrian Marshall Plan Foundation Fellow at the Wilson Center in Washington, DC. Additionally, he is also a senior researcher at the High North Center at Nord University in Norway, and a senior research fellow and leadership group member at the Arctic Institute. His research focuses on European Union Arctic policies, maritime transportation, international law, and new technologies introduction to the North. He holds a jointly awarded PhD in political science from the University of Cologne and the University of Edinburgh, and is the author of the European Union and the Geopolitics of the Arctic. So without any further ado, I would like to commence our webinar and we will begin with Captain Furia's presentation. He will discuss the sustainable use of fisheries resources and maritime security in his presentation. Furia Sensei, the webinar platform is yours. Uh, thank you very much, Ren, for your kind introduction. Uh, good morning for those participating from Europe and good evening for those from Asia. I'm Captain Kentaro Furia of Japan Coast Guard and adjunct professor at the National Graduate Institute for Policy Studies and Japan Coast Guard Academy. Firstly, I'd like to express my sincere appreciation uh, for having me at this important conference. I'm very honored to be here as a speaker. Also, I'd like to extend my gratitude to those who uh, working for, for hosting this conference. Uh, let me share my presentation. Can you see the screen? Oh, yes, thank you very much. Well, today I'd like to argue that in order to mitigate uh, IUU fishing, illegal, unreported, unregulated fishing, regional and international cohesive efforts among relevant states are essential through an analysis of Japanese experience. 
I will briefly touch on that IUU fishing is not only a matter of fish resources and a matter of food security, but also a hotbed of other criminal activities at sea. Then I will introduce two cases to analyze the necessity for state to play different roles to reduce IUU fishing. Why are you fishing so serious these days? Uh, fishing resources used to be considered countless uh, due to the vastness of the ocean. No one could count fish resources in the ocean, and thus uh, fish resources are infinite. Uh, however, no one believes uh, such fairy tale in modern age. Well-developed uh, fishing technologies likely endanger fish species to extinct. Uh, therefore, fish need to be protected for sustainable use by conservation and management measures by states. Nevertheless, IUU fishing ruins all those conservation and management measures by a coastal state. A fishery regulation to limit fishing gears and method would never be observed, so the risk of overexploitation increases and the population of fish cannot be maintained for the next season. Scientific research to estimate the population of resources and catch is essential to conserve uh, sustainable use of resources, while yield resulting from IUU fishing will never be reported, which lead to underestimating catch. As a result, the sustainability of uh, the use of fish resources will really highly deteriorate and become a matter of food security as one of the primary sources of protein. And this is not only the reason to condemn IUU fishing. More seriously, small and maneuverable fish boats are often used for other criminal activities at sea. Numerous reports have been made through national and international institutions where a fishing boat is used for maritime crime criminal activities. Those activities may include smuggling of drugs, weapons, and other contrabands, and trafficking of human beings. Some reports revealed abuse of fishers with extended working hours, much similar to slavery conditions, without less time or even wages. Surprisingly, a fishery boat was used as a spy boat near the Japanese coast two decades ago, in which Japan Coast Guard exchanged fire with spy boats. Thus, a fishery boat may be used as a base for different illegal activities at sea. Uh, before introducing uh, cases around Japan, let me introduce the rights and duties of the flag state and coastal state under international law, uh, particularly including the United Nations Convention of the Law of the Sea, or UNCLOS, relating to fishery activities in EEZ or ex exclusive economic zones. The flag state has an obligation to exercise jurisdiction over ships flying under the flag, effectively regardless of wherever they sail. Also, the flag state has a duty to ensure its fishery boats not to engage in illegal activities wherever they sail. In order to fulfill those duties, the flag states are required to monitor, control, and survey the fishery boats flying their flag. The duty of the flag state is based on the nationality of the ships and not by the maritime zone. On the other hand, uh, rights and duties of the coastal states are based on the maritime zones. Coastal states can enjoy natural resources, including fish resources, in their EEZ, uh, which is extended uh, to 200 nautical miles from the baselines. At the same time, the coastal states have an obligation to ensure not to endanger living resources in their EEZs by taking proper conservation and management measures. The measures including uh, adapting laws and regulation for avoiding overexploitation of living resources and taking law enforcement measures to ensure such sustainable standards are observed. Port states can cooperate in fighting IUU fishing by taking measures under, for example, the Port State Measures Agreement or PMSA, PSMA 
Under this agreement, a port state refuses designated fishery boats on the blacklist to enter into its port and unload the catch. Fishers would not use such ships enlisted in the blacklist. These measures are particularly effective at supplementing the duties of the flag state when a fishery boat is registered so-called the flag of convenience state, which does not have the willingness or capability to exercise jurisdiction effectively. Now let's move to the Japanese examples. Uh, there are two cases. Uh, with the legal regime of fishery in mind, uh, let me introduce a uh, fishing cases around Japan. In mid-September 2014, about 20 Chinese coral fishing trawlers were observed off Ogasawara Island's chains. That is located here. Uh, here, uh, Japan, Japanese main Honshu Island, and those are the vicinity of the Chinese uh, trawlers. The number of Chinese trawlers increased substantially at the record high number of 212 at the end of October the same year. Those trawlers did not have a valid fishing license, registration, and certification, and were also known as three nose ships. Chinese fishers targeted uh, red coral, which was valuable and expensive in China and Taiwan. Since red coral around the Chinese shore has been exhausted, Chinese fishers sold other fishery ground off Okinawa to Ogasawara, that is a Japanese shore. Uh, fishers aim to get rich quickly by catching precious red coral there. In addition to the threat of exhausted, exhaustion of precious red coral, one of the biggest problems was the, uh, that those Chinese fishers use bottom trawling, which destroyed fishery grounds. Red, control, red coral contributes as a spawning ground and shelters for fish. Destruction of red coral would lead to the reduction of fish resources there. Moreover, the growth rate of red coral is very slow at 0.3 millimeters per year. Once desertification of the rich fishery ground by those coral of Ogasawara occurs, the damage to fishery ground remains for years. A survey revealed a broken red coral and destruction of fish spawning grounds by abundant uh, trawling nets. As a coastal state, a Japanese government took robust measures against coral poaching. The government adopted an, an amendment to the fishery laws to increase penalties to up to tenfold to deter illegal fishing in Japanese waters. The relevant authorities, including the fit Japanese the fishery agency and Japan Coast Guard initiated law enforcement measures against Chinese coral trawlers. Multiple fishery survey ships and patrol ships were deployed on the scene, and the aerial survey were carried out to monitor the activities of trawlers. Japanese authorities watched the movement of Chinese trawlers carefully in the nights and days. Patrol ships uh, showed their presence and warned resolutely whenever a suspicious maneuver was detected, thereby stopping Chinese poaching. Japanese authorities controlled the swarm of Chinese trawlers not to let the trawling net down to the bottom while considering the freedom of navigation of Chinese trawlers in Japanese EEZ. Uh, surprisingly, this strategy to avoid catching coral was prioritized rather than arrest skippers for prosecution and the uh, number of patrol ships increased. Uh, taking legal procedures is undoubtedly the most robust law enforcement measures. However, it takes more than two weeks to bring the trawlers back to Honshu Main Island for procedures and file a single case for prosecution. The limited law enforcement asset could be exhausted without counting, countering the swarm of Chinese trawlers remaining at the scene for catching red coral. Only when the violation was serious, such as poaching in the Japanese territorial waters, did authorities or arrest a skipper for legal proceedings in Japan, despite the time necessary. The strategy worked well to maintain uh, the good legal order at the scene. In addition, diplomatic efforts were made uh, the Japanese government asked the Chinese government to take action to improve the situation. In particular, Japanese authorities 
requested the Chinese counterpart to take robust enforcement measures against those call robots in their home port in China. Japanese authorities shared data、uh, relating to the identification of Chinese trawlers at the scene. Chinese authorities visited and inspected the boat at their home port. If violation was recognized, then the Chinese authorities took enforcement measures, such as arrest of skippers and confiscation of cola, called illegally, which were reported back to the Japanese authorities. Those combined efforts worked very well. Gradually, the number of Chinese trawlers、uh, decreased, and finally, no trawlers were observed towards the end of November. This successful case results from co cohesive effort by both Japan as a coastal state and China as a flag or port state of trawlers to mitigate illegal、uh, fishing off the Ogasawara Islands. Uh, this is the second case. On the other hand, porting in Japanese sea by Chap、uh, Chinese fishers remains a serious threat to fish resources and legal order at sea. According to the statistics of the Japanese Fishery Agency, the fishery inspection ships warned more than 4,300 Chinese fishery boats in 2020、mm -hmm. in the Japanese sea. Bigger Chinese ships use restricted and unrestricted right to attract squid. And pair trawling to catch fish, which potentially roots out the resources. As a result of strategic deployment of patrol ships, the number of warning reduced to around 600 in 2021,、uh, but the threat still remains. The target of Chinese fishers in the Japanese Sea is squid.、Uh, Japanese Sea is o p p o s i t e side of the Pacific Ocean.、Uh, here we have uh, uh, Honshu Main Island, and、uh, this Part of the ocean that is surrounded by Japan, Korea,、uh, North Korea, and Russia is、uh, Japanese Sea.、Um, the, those Chinese boats are also three no boats without a barrage fishing license, registration, and certification. Again, as a result of the poaching by a massive number of fishery boats, a survey revealed the record reduction of squid resources in the Japanese Sea. Besides, a UN expert pointed out that Chinese fishers bought fishing rights from North Korea, which violates United Nations Security Council Resolution 2371 and 2397, both in 2017.、Uh, please note that China is not a coastal state of the Japanese Sea. And similar to previous cases,、uh, combined efforts by fishery a g e n c y and、uh, Japan Coast Guard were made. Those agencies deploy surface and area assets regularly to monitor the movement of fishery boats. A similar strategy has been taken to expel those boats from Japanese EED not to catch squid in the Japanese waters. When warnings are ignored, patrol ships even use water cannon to attract the warning. In addition, diplomatic efforts have been made to mitigate the number of Chinese fishery boats. The Japanese Ministry of Foreign Affairs urged China as a flag state to take enforcement measures against those Chinese fishery boats and boats brought this issue to the Japanese Japan China high level consultation on maritime affairs in 2021. Nevertheless, the Japanese authority has not yet seen its Chinese counterpart take effective measures against those three no boats and violation of. United Nations Security Council resolution at their mother port in China. The different policy taken by the flag state led、uh, the different results. The Japanese authorities、uh, took similar operations against Chinese trawlers of Ogasawara and those boats in Japanese sea. In addition, the diplomatic efforts have been made similarly to reduce the number of Chinese fishery boats. Contrarily, the Chinese authorities took different approaches in those two cases. In the case of Ogasawara coral poaching, the Chinese authorities took effective law enforcement measures at the mother port when those trawlers went back to China as a flag state.、Uh, this is partly because the Chinese government enlisted red coral in Annex 3 of the Convention on International Trade in Endangered Species of Wild Fauna and Flora. That is also known as the Washington Convention, calling on the international community to regulate international trade. 
tighter control over its own fishing vessel may also have been necessary as a part of the move to regulate international trade. On the other hand, in the latter cases, uh, Chinese authorities do not take robust measures against those Chinese uh, squid boats in the Japanese sea at their mother port. Chinese authorities introduce now widely spread the Baidu satellite navigation system as best monitoring system to control Chinese fishery boats. These measures would work to reduce IUU fishing. However, it is doubtful whether those three no boats activate the Baidu system while they illegally engage in fishery operations. Besides, the authority did not take responsible actions as necessary under international law for the violation of UN Security Council resolutions to purchase the fishing license from North Korea. One analysis pointed out that it would be because of the possible Chinese strategy to disperse Chinese, uh, sorry, Japanese assets, particularly patrol ships of the Japan Coast Guard, which also deployed off Senkaku Island in the East China Sea to the Japanese Sea. In the East China Sea, the Japan Coast Guard and Chinese counterpart are confronting 24-7. In summary, the Japanese example clearly demonstrates that states need to play their role under international law to mitigate IUU fishing. The, coral state, uh, sorry, the coastal state should take conservation and management measures for sustainable use of living resources in their EEZs. In particular, robust enforcement operations to deter illegal activities at sea effectively. However, the effort for of the coastal state only are not enough. At the same time, the coastal state need to seek cooperation with the flag state of the fishery board and other relevant states. The flag state in turn should seriously discharge obligations under international law, particularly those of exercise jurisdiction effectively and ensuring not engage in illegal activities. The risk of measures taken at home port would certainly discourage fishers from IUU fishing, even in the foreign EEZ and high seas. Thank you very much. Uh, I'll stop here and back to Ren. Thank you, Furuya Sensei, for the thorough overview of how Japan is handling IOU fishing and the challenge that it presents to the sustainable and secure use of the oceans. That was particularly interesting to hear your insights into the legal barriers to addressing IOU fishing. And um, I hope that we can draw more on your experience, both as a practitioner in Japan's Coast Guard and as an academic in the Q&A when we discuss in more detail, um, both speakers' presentations. I would like to take this opportunity to again remind the audience that the question and answer function is open and you can submit your questions within the chat function on Teams. And we look forward to engaging with you uh, at the Q&A. Uh, but before we have our Q&A discussion, I would like to invite our next speaker, Dr. Raskolnik, who will help us unpack and understand what some are now referring to as the blue turn in international relations. Andreas, the webinar platform is yours. Thank you very much, Wen. Uh, Ren, uh, you can still call me Andreas, I'm not Dr. Rasputin. Um, but first of all, thank you very much for organizing this event. Uh, good morning uh, to everyone in Europe. Good evening to all of you in Japan. Um, Thanks for inviting me and uh, share my screen and provide you with a bit of a different uh, idea about today's topic. All right, hope you can see my presentation now. If not, somebody will scream and say, no, we don't see it. Anyway, I hope uh, you see everything. Um, again, thanks for inviting. Um, um, let's see of what I can provide to today's uh, topic and today's um, discussion. The idea of my presentation is a bit more of an abstract one, um, talking less about more practical um, incidents and practical experiences from ocean governance and talking more about a term, a concept that has become very popular over the last decade, I would say, uh, not only in my geographical uh, area of expertise, but globally and that's the blue economy. 
uh, why have I dealt with the blue economy? And I think that says a bit about uh, today's presentation about the complexity of the term. Um, for the past three years, I managed a project that looked at ocean economies in North Norway and Alaska and on how these two Arctic and these two peripheral regions of the world can probably or potentially collaborate in the field of ocean economy, blue economy. And we called it the, the blue economy uh, related project. And when starting the project, it was actually for the very first time we looked into the, the idea and the concept and the definition of the blue economy and then soon realized, uh, yeah, this is rather complex and too many definitions, uh, very vague definitions, too many meanings all over the world. Uh, and today's presentation is a bit like going into that direction. You know, what does the blue economy actually mean and how can we potentially find a common definition, uh, you know, that, that works um, for many different regions of the world and then it essentially also work for international negotiations or international definitions of what the blue economy could be in order to kind of sustainably uh, exploit uh, and use uh, our ocean resources. Um, as I said, the blue economy is, is a rather new concept. It is part of a new wave of economic thought, basically, that emphasizes the sustainable use of natural resources in the world's oceans, um, uh, seas and coastal areas. So, so uh, basically it's an evolution of ideas started from the sustainable economies uh, already evolving in the 1980s and is further grounded in the idea of a green economy, you know, which posits that growth and the improvement of livelihoods can be achieved in a rather sustainable manner, whatever sustainable development and sustainability means. You know. the, the origin of the term, you know, the blue economy, blue growth, um, whatever you, you have heard before, is a bit obscure and it's not really known or not really known. It's you know, unknown on where it started. Some attribute it to the Rio 20 a plus 20 UN conference on sustainable development in 2012. But of course, examples can be found rather, uh, way earlier. And of course, we all know that the many activities of the ocean, the you know, ocean economy, that essentially also make the blue economy, such as fisheries, marine transportation, have been part of human economy activities for centuries uh, and even longer. Uh, however, the, the concept the blue economy, blue growth, blue, blue growth, sorry, is also very closely linked to the sustainable development gold uh, number 14 and the aim to conserve and sustainably use the ocean, the seas and the marine resources for the sustainable development. Um, however, as a guide to policy making and to policy makers, the blue economy is used quite differently. Um, developed countries, developed regions like in the United States or here in Europe have not often used the term blue technology, blue growth um, and such related definitions. However, developing countries have often paid particular attention to what we have heard before, also to the challenges of over and illegal fishing. So generally, while there is a widespread agreement that blue economy means connecting economic use of the ocean with the sustainable ecosystem and the environmental conditions, translating this very broad uh, aspiration into actual decision making by governments has proved rather complex and difficult. So Andreas, yes, I wonder um, maybe if we should be seeing the next slide. Is it we're still on the first slide? Is that correct? Sure. I think uh, maybe we need to go into presentation mode. Yeah, no, no, no. Can you see it? No, um, I don't think it's in presentation mode. So we see the the intro slide that discussing the Arctic's value. What about now? Uh, still on the same initial slide. Oh, this is too bad. Let me, why is that the case? Sorry, guys. Um, I was on the second slide for a while. Um, can you see it now? Uh, we see the first slide. If you maybe um, click manually from slide to slide, maybe just click to the next slide. Yes, there we go. Now we see. So it might just require some manual clicking. Which one can you see now? Blue economy, a new concept. Second and slide. Still the same? Still the same. This is insane. Why is that the case? Sorry, guys. You see, it's not about the no blue problem. economy. It's about technology. Share. Oh. 
All right. Uh, yeah, I have no idea. Now you can still see the blue economy, new concept one. Yes. But it's not moving forward. Not right now. No, it's still on the blue economy slide. But I think if you manually, can yeah. you manually go to the next slide like that? Yeah. So then we see the sustainable blue slide. So perhaps as you go through the presentation, if you okay. can manually. Sorry, sorry, guys. I don't know. What it <laughs> Thank is. you. You know, I sorry for like the complication. The generation. The webinar you know, life. Yeah. That, you know that manages teams, but I yeah. Okay. Now we have seen uh, the blue economy as a concept and um, now going a bit more into the definition, what the blue economy could mean, you know, and the complexity of, of the blue economy as such is that, you know, I've already said the blue of the economy is of course directly related to uh, large bodies of water, the oceans, the seas, but of course also large, in, uh, large inlet lakes. Um, for smaller island nations, most of the economies are inevitably blue because those islands depend on fishing, shipping, tourism, marine-based tourism, or other marine-based economic activity. Um, for countries for, with larger coastlines, uh, the blue economy then often also relates to, uh, you know, resources and other means. Um, as I said before, the blue economy does descend from decades of discussion on sustainable sustainability and the fairy tale, as I call it here, of sustainable sustainable development. What does it really mean, you know? But it aims to capture the definition of sustainability as, you know, meeting the needs of the present without sacrificing the ability to meet the needs of tomorrow. And of course, this links to the idea of sustainability is, you know, to find the right balance between the intersection of economy, uh, environmental and social aspects of society. So what we have seen over the last two decades were, like, you know, several de definitions of the blue economy and they all, as you can see here, kind of relate to similar ideas, you know, you maximize the economic value of marine resources, but however, do it in a sustainable, environmental, sustainable way. You know, you seek to promote economic growth, but always, you know, have this vision of doing it in an environmental, but also social sustainable way. Now jump back and forth. So hopefully you can see now the next slide. This is very annoying, but bear with me, you know. Uh, so basically uh, everything we need it is, you know, kind of subsumed under the term blue economy. It's about maximizing, promoting, but also, of course, improving, reducing, ensuring, you know, resilience in a way. So based on this rather broad definition, uh, very briefly introduced another the concept of the blue economy rests with uh, these main themes, you know, on the one hand, the sustainable and inclusive growth and development. Second theme, you know, reducing the risk of overexploitation and risky methods of extraction. Third theme, you know, enhancing the welfare of social of coastline communities in terms of both economic opportunities, but also social protection. And uh, uh, last but not least, you know, ensuring resilience of those communities and countries to natural resources and the impact of climate change, you know. Um, and eventually, as we talk about the blue economy in these very abstract terms, you know, uh, the blue economy uh, comprises economic activities, you know, that directly take place in the ocean and seas or the out or uses output from the sea for the consumption or as a source of income. So very, very broadly, you know, when defining uh, what the blue economy is, we need to look into what our ocean economies, you know, so you will see the blue economy, you know, including very established industry like fisheries, but also shipbuilding, marine destruction, you know, uh, research, transportation, uh, and also, um, emerging industry like agriculture, which is very popular in Norway, seabed mining and others. So you see, you know, the blue, even it has this green component, you know, in, in the term itself, in the definition itself, it of course also uh, involves offshore oil and gas, you know, or marine transportation, which are probably not considered that blue or that green, you know, um, but you weren't able to see that because I moved forward. Sorry for that. Um, so I was here, established industry, emerging industries, you know, uh, that slide. Again, I will go back and forth. Do it like that way, so you see. Huh? So the real question is, you know, when, you know, having this abstract term, you know, this rather complex term, various definition, various ideas of what the blue economy actually is and what kind of industries it involves, it is, is the idea, you know, how can we go from a very blue working definition to uh, a blue strategy, you know, and 
at FNI or here in Norway, we've been trying now for three years to convince the Norwegian Research Council to give us research funding to look into that matter. You know, uh, Ren knows very much how difficult it is to get research funding in Norway sometimes. But, uh, you know, the idea is really, OK, what is the blue economy on the one hand and how can we really develop a blue strategy based on this various definition and this idea, you know, to have economic growth on the one hand, but do it in a sustainable manner. I'll not go too much into depth here what a, a blue strategy could mean, but I think four, four or five elements are rather important just for you to keep in mind what a strategy could mean for a coastal state, as for example, Norway or also Japan. The one hand is, of course, investment, you know, so such a strategy would need the de deployment of financial capital, physical capital, natural capital, so to really maximize the returns that uh, would reflect both the underlying economic but ecolog uh, ecological conditions. Uh, the other one would be a focus on the customers. You know, the, the idea that if you develop the blue economy in a sustainable way, uh, these resources pro most probably also cost more than uh, maybe done the other way around. You also need to convince the customers, you know, uh, about such a, a blue strategy, if you want to call it. It's what we heard before. It's a bit of the management issues, you know, the day to day decision making and all kind of organizations and, and ministries that deal with the responsibility of shaping a blue and an blue ocean economy. And a third relevant theme is, of course, the matter of innovation, uh, in, you know, technological innovation, but also with regard to organizations, you know, how can you better manage uh, resources as such? Uh, so a few definitions just to keep in mind or a few elements when we talk about, about the blue potential strategy. But again, I don't want to focus too much into it, but I just emphasize the need that it's not only complex to define the blue economy, it would also be it's very complex to develop a blue economic strategy in that regard. Back and forth. So um, with that long introduction, I want to jump a bit more into uh, my field of research, and that is, of course, the Arctic. Um, I have no idea how many Arctic experts we have here uh, uh, listening to us, but um, just a few points I think are very important uh, when we discuss the Arctic. Um, I think the main point is always for us researchers to emphasize that there's not only one Arctic, but many different Arctics. What do we mean by that? You know, it makes a difference if you live in northern Norway or if, if you live in Alaska or northern Russia, you know, uh, for climate conditions, for infrastructure reasons, uh, whatever, you know, just to keep that in mind that when you in for the, for the sake of our event today, when you want to develop a blue economy in northern Norway or in Iceland, it might be easier than in other parts of the Arctic. Uh, what we also know is that most of the Arctic is blue in a way. You know, the Arctic is not a continent, it's, a, it's an ocean. Uh, however, and I think that WWF put it quite well at some point, you know, what can we consider Arctic blue or a blue Arctic economy? You know, uh, is it only about fisheries or shipping? Or is it already about Arctic tourism, you know, and when we talk about Arctic tourism, is it only about passengers on cruise ships? Or is it also people that fly into the Arctic and then go on whale watching? So even like these nuances of defining what an Arctic blue economy from, for example, the economic sectors of tourism is rather tricky, you know. And as I said before, the blue economy is not only about fisheries, aquaculture, but it also involves uh, sectors, economic sectors that we might not consider per se a green or blue. Um, so back and forth, sorry for that. Um, and when we really, you know, take these, um, the complexity of the Arctic itself, you know, and then put the blue economic umbrella uh, over the Arctic, you know, a, a few things we also need to understand of why the Arctic might be important, might be very regionally, of course, important, less maybe on the global scale, but nevertheless, you know, uh, First of all, we need to understand that global trends also have an effect on the Arctic. And I'm not only talking about what's happening currently in, 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 in Europe, in Ukraine. You know, of course, uh, geopolitical events will have an event on the Arctic. Uh, but essentially, there are also three other factors that transform the Arctic. Climate change, undoubtedly. Uh, technological development, you know, um, and a uh, third very important aspect also with regard to the Arctic blue economies, of course, the global economic demand, you know, and the need for more resources in many different ways, you know. Um, what we have seen with the Arctic is there is increased investment potential also in the blue uh, economy, economy in the Arctic. Uh, however, again, 
keep the different Arctics of the Arctics in mind, it makes a difference, you know, in which region you are, and there will be region that might develop faster than others. You know, for example, Northern Norway, which already has a, a large blue economy uh, with regard to fisheries, uh, aquaculture, and others. Um, and of course, uh, what I refer to here as the multidimensional challenge is really how can you gain more economic value from resources, but do the, doing that in a very sustainable way. Um, and because we talked about fish before, I also want to briefly talk about Arctic fish. Again, I'm not sure if I have the exact numbers here, but as I said before, Arctic fisheries uh, might not be significant from a global perspective you know it's only about six percent of the total fish caught uh, come from the arctic but of course they're extremely important regionally you know before that um, conversation we we talked a bit about salmon production in russia and how uh, that has an effect on a Japanese uh, economy, you know, because of the sanctions. Um, and of course, Norway, for example, has a huge aquaculture production. Alaska has a huge maritime, uh, growing mariculture uh, production and, and salmon production as such. So of course, regional production has an, uh, an impact for those countries, for those uh, counties, for those regions, um, of course, uh, from an economic perspective. So for example, as we can see here, like about 90% 90 per, 90 in Greenland, 90% of the fish caught in Greenland are uh, designed for export. Norway is a bit less, but nevertheless, again, you know, very important for northern Norway. Um, and of course, aquaculture in that regard is not anymore that the new economy, economy and the new sector to be developed, but uh, more and more growing, you know. Um, Talking about governance, and I think that's an important uh, matter also from what we have heard before. You know, we have heard that the blue economy is complex. We have heard that the blue economy means different things for different uh, stakeholders, for different countries, for different coastal areas, uh, and how to govern that. You know, and what we have done, what I've said before a bit in, in our project for the last three years, comparing uh, economic structures, governance structures, social structures in Alaska and North Norway, you know, and try to find an idea of how these two peripheral regions can potentially collaborate and uh, share best practice uh, under a blue economy umbrella. And when we dis dis discuss governance, we saw that, you know, it's very hard to compare um, these two regions, you know, and to compare in a way apple and oranges because uh, of different legal contexts, you know, of course, you have UNCLOS and United Nations Law of the Sea, international law uh, managing um, parts of fisheries, but then you have different legal contexts in these different regions. And the problem is, you know, how can you bring those together and how can you make regions that are already very different, you know, from a climate perspective, from a social perspective, uh, learn from each other under a blue um, uh, economy umbrella. and even more difficult we have experienced it is in aquaculture because there's no international legis legislation it's very much dependent on the countries themselves uh, so the question of uh, the blue economy as a probably an umbrella term that brings together various ideas uh, becomes even more problematic when you you know dig deeper into several regions or some particular kind of regions all over the world um, so the question is really then and that's maybe second last slide is you know how can we then value the arctic or any other region uh, when using a, a blue economy umbrella you know keeping in mind the complexity of the term itself the difficulty to create a, a blue economic strategy you know that can be used by policymakers regional policymaker local policymaker national policymakers you know uh, in a way that we differently value uh, ocean-based resources, you know, not only looking on, you know, how to exploit them, how to sell them, but also like put them in context of uh, social conditions and other conditions, uh, 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 environmental conditions in a way. Um, so basically, you know, the blue economy takes a very, it takes a much broader perspective on the gains and losses of investment. You know, it's not only about selling products, it really uh, includes, you know, the success of private sector investments, the effects on the labor market, but of course also on the stock of natural resources and how are they used efficiently and non-efficiently uh, non and whether the values of ecosystems are being degraded or improved. So the very complex way, you know, to bring uh, in a case marine fisheries uh, as in one of the economic sectors, uh, you know, under the blue umbrella. Marine fisheries, regardless if it's in the Arctic or not, is 
in many ways the best activity to demonstrate the way in which the blue economy perspective can work because a lot of these elements I have just mentioned, you know, environmental conditions, ecological uh, conditions, uh, um, economic conditions, social conditions, you know, have been studied uh, over the years um, in many different areas and, you know, you have a, a broad uh, base of knowledge, you know, but the question is really, you know, how can you bring that data together? And we talked a bit, you know, about ocean governance, you know, and how states can learn from each other. So I think one of the key takeaways in every discussion is, of course, that, you know, interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary science is not only required, but you also need to bring, aim, you need to bring together regions that are either not that often, you know, under research focus, or maybe are problematic in comparing, you know, because as I said, you know, you don't want to compare apple and oranges, but um, you know, have, find an idea of how is the blue economy in a certain sector like marine fisheries, aquaculture discussed in a certain area, in a certain region, and how can you bring these two uh, discussions together? You know, in a from our perspective, in a very academic and research effort. You know, um, and now the last slide. So, what can be really done from a policymaker from an academic perspective, you know, how can we foster knowledge transfer? How can we build regional capacity and actually provide for very concrete examples of cooperation in, in my field of research Arctic cooperation? But how can we really also go beyond certain regions and, you know, foster not only capa or enhance capacity building, but essentially then also foster knowledge transfer, you know? Um, First of all, and, and and this is very much Arctic uh, based, so I apologize a bit for that. But um, the questions are really how can we best assess uh, the need, the, the natural capital, and sorry again, how can we best assess uh, the need to reflect uh, the rapid climate change all over the world? You know, and how can we, you know, make sure that those changes are constantly implemented in our decision making and our management making. Um, in many regions of the world, but also in, definitely in the Arctic, you know, how can we reflect the world views of indigenous peoples, you know, of that kind of history, knowledge history for decades and centuries, you know, into, you know, how nature changes. Um, the third is, um, this is a bit more complex, but how can we improve the valuation methods? You know, how can we really bring together on the one hand, you know, we need to exploit resources for the sake of, you know, us uh, getting, uh, you know, uh, having enough food on the table. But on the other hand, you know, what kind of impact does that have on the on the certain regions, on certain ocean areas, et cetera, et cetera. And fourth and finally, you know, how can we go um, from the complexity um, of the blue economy and often then the simplicity of using that term, you know, because as I said before, everything is blue. Everybody wants to develop a blue economy, a green economy, and not necessarily a brown economy. So the term, although it's so complex, it's used rather simplicity by many policymakers. And how can we go from that uh, starting point into a very nuanced approach and very nuanced discussion that eventually leads then also into a way for better informing policymakers of what, you know, researchers, scientists, um, regardless if they sit in Oslo, if they sit in Tokyo, no? um, how can we share a common language and, and bring, you, you know, help in going from complex way into a more a complex discussion, into a more nuanced discussion, and then take the next steps, you know, bring that complexity uh, to policymakers in a, in a language also policymakers uh, understand better. Um, and that's it, I guess. Uh, I have a last slide which has nothing to do with uh, the Arctic or the uh, the blue economy, but that's uh, where I work when I'm in Oslo. It's the Friedrich Nansen Institute. Uh, and yeah, thank you very much. I apologize again for apparently being one of the millennials that doesn't understand how teams work, but um, I guess uh, you saw at least one slide update each other. So thank you very much and uh, okay. looking forward to any questions you might have. Thank you so much, Andreas, for sharing your deep insight into the blue economy and for walking us not only through the evolution of the term and the idea of the blue economy, but also bringing it into a context, the Arctic context, and to discussing the challenges um, in trying to really, you know, move from a very abstract term to concrete 
um, workable, actionable items related to the blue economy. So I will be excited to hear some more about your um, uh, thinking and research on this in the Q&A. And so now I would like to open the webinar for the Q&A. And um, again, the function on Teams is that you just submit your questions uh, within the chat function and we will um, take them up as we move along in the Q&A. And um, to kick off, I thought I could um, ask our speakers um, more um, uh, specifically on the context that they are discussing, um, the geographic context, actually, and more specifically Japan and, and Norway, or if you would like to speak more on the EU, Andreas, that is fine as well. But um, Furia Sensei, I wanted to ask you a little bit about um, capacity, capacity building efforts on the part of Japan um, to address the IOU issue. Um, as you brought up, Japan has great experience with IUU, and IUU is a you know, prominent issue in many parts of um, the ocean space. And so I wonder, from the lessons that Japan has learned, and also you know, the barriers, like you said, the legal barriers that still are persistent and something that need to be um, addressed and worked with, what kind of um, knowledge sharing does Japan engage in in the region? For instance, perhaps in Southeast Asia or um, in, in nearby waters to, to share its experience with IUU fishing. I would be interested to hear more about capacity building efforts. So um, that is my initial question. And, and a little bit related to that, of course, is the um, you brought up the East China Sea, and I recall that Taiwan and Japan had signed um, a fishing agreement and and been able to address the challenges that they had uh, faced in the East China Sea context. Perhaps you could um, tell us a little bit more about um, those kinds of agreements and what they could be potentially for other IUU um, challenges ahead. Um, and Andreas, again, thank you so much for your deep um, overview of the blue economy. As you mentioned, you have been engaged in a research project looking at the blue economy in very different contexts. And there's challenges, of course, when it comes to comparing different governance um, mechanisms and different societal climates. And I'm wondering if there were any um, issue areas, you had brought up um, marine fisheries, but other issue areas or case studies or examples of um, you know, prominent good practices for a blue economy environment. Maybe there's a specific location or a specific um, topic that you could share uh, a little bit more on. So um, if I could kick off the Q&A with those two inquiries, uh, and perhaps we could begin with uh, you, Furia Sensei, if that's OK, on discussing Japan's capacity building on IUU issues. Uh, well, thank you very much, Ren. Uh, well, actually, I wrote a chapter of a book uh, relating to the capacity building efforts by Japan Coast Guard and its implication. Uh, so, you know, it, it takes really another 20 minutes <laughs> to go over those uh, arguments that I made. And I, also, I wrote some uh, research papers on uh, different uh, uh, for us. So, well, the the capacity building program by Japanese Coast Guard is really long history. Uh, you know, in the very beginning, it was uh, you know uh, the safety aspect of the shipping, particularly for example in the Manaka Singapore Straits, that is one of the choke point for the shipping industry. And in order to ensure the safety of, for example, tanker ships passing through the Panaka Singapore Strait is an enormous problem when uh, uh, in the 1970s. And then gradually we expanded the, the scope of the capacity building, not only to the safety of navigation, but including the search and rescue, uh, protection and preservation of marine environment from oil spill incident, and then law enforcement operation, uh, particularly after 2000 when uh, the Asian piracy was so high. Uh, uh, at that time. And then uh, what we are doing, particularly for uh, Asian countries, not only the Southeast Asian countries, but also the South Asian countries, is that, uh, well, you know, 
the, the law enforcement of operation by nature must be in accordance with uh, law. That may be the, uh, you know, the domestic law as well as international law. And then the law enforcement officials need to understand the different roles to play uh, between the international law and domestic law. Then that is one point that we need to, uh, you know, uh, to, to highlight uh, for those participants from the Coast Guard officials in different countries. And then uh, what we highlight uh, during the uh, seminars or in the capacity building programs is rule-based order. This is particularly important in the South China Sea and even in East China Sea or even different parts of Asia. There are many you know, kind of confrontation between Coast Guard agencies not only the navies, but also the Coast Guard agencies. In order to minimize uh, the, you know, such incident uh, actually occurring uh, in those uh, part of ocean, we need to maintain the legal order, okay? Uh, this is particularly important. And then, uh, well, the, the role of international law is, you know, basically to, 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 to designate uh, the geographical scope of the jurisdiction, particularly enforcement jurisdiction. So uh, whether, you know, if you have a case in front of you, then they need to analyze whether they have jurisdiction over the case or even not. Then if you have jurisdiction, then what you should do. And then if you don't, then what you can do. Those are, you know, uh, kind of analysis based upon the case by case basis. And then uh, what we are teaching is that, uh, you know, how to analyze those cases. That, that is basic things. So the rule based order is one of the most important and central issue for the capacity building program for, uh, you know, different agents, uh, different nations of the Coast Guard agencies. And then well, the, uh, in relation to the, uh, uh, you know, the IUU fishing, uh, you know, the, the, I, there are two stances. As I presented in my, you know, presentation, a state may be a flag state if the ship flying its flag is committing acts of, you know, IUU fishing in different part of ocean. Then the flag state have a responsibility to exercise jurisdiction effectively over those ships. And also the, the flag state need to uh, ensure that uh, the, the ships under registration of that state is not engaged in illegal fishing, different parts of ocean. Okay, so in order to ensure those, you know, uh, the duties, the flag state may registrate, or if you have registration, then you need to enforce it. So uh, one thing is that you know that you know the those different responsibility is surely uh, you know and the their rights. And then if you are the coastal state, then you need to protect your EZs from the illegal fishing operation from other nations. So the, this is another way to deter IUU uh, fishing. So those are one of the things uh, we are uh, delivering as a a capacity building program. And relating to the uh, Taiwanese uh, fishery agreement, that, that, that is not official one. Uh, what, what I can say is that this, this is uh, the, the civilian agreement between, you know, uh, the prefectural, uh, you know, it, it, anyway, it is not, you know, the uh, endorsed by any government, but uh, that is a civilian agreement between uh, the two, uh, you know, citizens of Japan and Taiwan, and then uh, just uh, how to carry out fishing operations in the East China Sea, where, you know, the delimitation of uh, EZ of Japan, China, and even Taiwan is not decided yet. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Fudia Sensei, for sharing your insight on those topics. It's always interesting to hear from you as you can, you know, cover the practitioner perspective as well as the academic perspective. So um, very interesting um, insight. And Andreas, um, could I ask you uh, to uh, respond to my question about uh, specific contests, uh, a context of a successful blue economy or, or model blue economy um, 
initiatives? For sure, yes. Uh, now you can see me. Uh, can I maybe have also first have a follow up question uh, to Puglia Sensei? Uh, because what struck me in your presentation was like, you know, um, I have no knowledge about, you know, cooperation between Japan and, and China when it comes to illegal fishing matters or, you know, the problems or what are the, the big, we, we know a bit about the big problems here in Europe, but not the specifics. But what was really interesting for me was like that on the one hand, I think in the 2014 case, you had rather successful cooperation to tackle, you know, the illegal fishing, but not in a 2020 case. So uh, why was that the case? Why was it rather, you know, successful? Uh, the, the communication and the management of the issue in 2014, but not in 2020. Just to follow up, but then when I go into your question. <laughs> Well, uh, in, in very briefly, uh, you know, in, in that Cora case, uh, you know, it, it, the the Chinese government decided to end this the annex three of the convention, or Washington Convention, that to to preserve, uh, you know, the wild fauna and flora, uh, and then uh, the the China need to express its intention to the international community that the China is surely uh, protects the that Cora other uh, resources, right? Uh, on the other hand, in, in case of Japanese sea, that, that is squid, and that, you know, the price is much, much less than uh, that of the precious coral fish. And then, well, there is no motivation, probably, for the Chinese government uh, to, 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 to impose law enforcement operations against those ships, even though it is a violation of UN Security Council resolution. So, well, we need to, uh, you know, analyze much more the, the motivation of the Chinese government to take action. But, uh, you know, th this is surely uh, the reason for Chinese government. Thank you. If I could just hop in again before we go back to Andreas uh, and, and the question I had posed previously, because actually we have a question from the audience that is very similar to what Andreas just asked. And uh, the audience member also had an additional question towards the end of the comment. And I wanted to um, address that now since Fujiya Sensei is already on the topic. So this audience uh, member is asking if there are any examples of Chinese-Japanese cooperation despite no Chinese laws against law offenses made in Japanese zones. So as you had mentioned, China only cooperated in the first case due to red coral being listed as an endangered species in, the, in their own conventions. Um, in the second case study, it was, not, it was the case that there were not any rules aiding um, cooperation, but are there examples of cooperation despite there being no Chinese laws against a particular offense? Do you know of any, Furia Sensei? Well, that's, uh, you know, the difficult question. Uh, well, recently, those are two, you know, those two examples are, are very how say, controversial examples in Japan. So that was highlighted and then, uh, well, the diplomatic efforts were made, uh, as well as the, you know, the Japanese uh, individual uh, efforts. So, well, I'm quite not sure, but uh, anyway, in many cases, when you know the Chinese vessels without a registration, you know, a license or inspection, those uh, you know three no vessels is you know in violation of when they are engaged in a fishery operation in wherever they are they sail. I mean. Uh, even without uh, uh, outside of the you know their territorial waters or even EZ, uh, you know normally fishing license include where and when. So if uh, the Chinese vessels violate this uh, you know restriction, then it is violation of Chinese fishery regulation. I, I guess and in many cases in many you know countries, as well as the Japanese case. Thank so you anyway, it is violation. Yes. Yes. Mm. Thank you. Great, Andreas. Um, if I could turn to you now. Definitely. Uh, yeah. Uh, thanks again for the question. Um, so you asked for very specific topics or sectors of cooperation uh, within our project experience we made. Um, 
it's probably not uh, scientific knowledge, but it's more anecdotes. And we all know that, you know, a lot of anecdotes do, do not make uh, for proper scientific uh, findings. But um, what I find really found really interesting over the last uh, three years, you know, when discussing the blue economy potential, the potential for various regions to cooperate and, and collaborate and share best practices was on the one hand, our idea as researchers, as academics, you know, of, you know, how important collaboration is, collaboration between states, collaboration between local communities, between regions. And then, you know, go into the field more or less with that thought, you know, and ask uh, practitioners, uh, businesses, you know, say, okay, so you're an aquaculture firm in Northern Norway. Um, we have this project. Uh, we would like you, you know, to meet uh, your uh, colleagues in a way in Alaska to share best practices, you know, and it doesn't matter, you know, if we uh, talk, talk to Alaskans or to North Norwegians, one of the main point I, I was always amused by that was like, why should we cooperate, you know? They are like, you know, components on, on the markets, you know, we are competitors, you know, why should we share our best practices uh, with, you know, a region far, far away, even though it's the same Arctic, you know, in a way. And I found that extremely helpful for me as a researcher, you know, because what we learn all the time, you know, in, in university and then later on in our professional life is like international cooperation matters. You know? And then you talk to business makers uh, in a way, I, I put it now in a very black and white spot, but there we got to say, no, it's why should we cooperate? You know, and it was really, you know, tiptoeing around, you know, bringing people together and, you know, said, OK, but what can you at least learn from each other? And that was one anecdote. And the second anecdote was, again, that, as I mentioned before, we talk often about the one Arctic, but then we have different Arctics within the Arctic. And in one incident, we brought Norwegian policymakers to Alaska, you know, and then the idea about talking how to sustainably, uh, you know, exploit resources, uh, there was some different idea of how to define sustainable development in Norway and in Alaska, you know, and with a very strong emphasis in Norway on the sustainable development goals, you know, and how you have to implement those goals into policy making and a different idea in Alaska, you know, what sustainability is, or not even what sustainability is, you know, but what the term is and how one can and should use the term. So uh, I think these two anecdotes, again, um, maybe not per se practices or, or you know, like examples on, on where best practices have been shared between regions, but I found that at least in follow up for us in our professional life, you know, and how to follow up in, in research uh, and how to, you know, combine different languages and different ideas about the same topic into one, you know, uh, project. Uh, extremely helpful because uh, even though, you know, you have this idea to work interdisciplinary, to bring not only different disciplines, academic disciplines together, but also, you know, step outside our own ivory tower, you know, and do something that actually matters uh, to uh, businesses and the, the broad economy, you know, and then realizing that, hey, <laughs> we have one idea uh, and maybe the other side has a different idea and how can we actually bring these two, um, you know, thoughts together and, and maybe the blue economy could help in a way, you know, if, if you really, you know, step deeper into uh, a more nuanced approach of what it could be and how different regions and different stakeholders think differently. Uh, and, and another anecdote is really like, you know, a lot of people you talk with the blue uh, about the blue economy, they automatically talk about fisheries and aquaculture, although per se the blue economy involves so many more ocean uh, economies. Uh, so it, it's also like, you know, you have to constantly repeat yourself, you know, and you know, maybe our destiny. But yeah, no, these were the two the anecdotes more or less, you know, I can I can definitely share which were in a way amusing as well. Yes, thank you. That was great. Uh, uh, those anecdotes are, are, you know, really meaningful and uh, I think a good reminder of the, the true challenges that we face cooperating on these issues, not just in terms of understanding um, from different um, standpoints how, you know, the blue economy is playing out in the local context, but also maybe like you say, the business aspect where you maybe don't want to share your best practices or you want to protect certain parts of your blue economy to keep it blue. Um, so thank you so much for sharing that insight and also a nice reminder to um, academics to get into the field and to really um, try to speak to those involved with the, you know, the terms for we're researching and, and doing um, active pub publications on. Um, so 
Uh, I see that uh, the time is uh, shortly running out. Shortly, we will have to close this webinar, but I wanted to quickly um, ask one closing question to our speakers. And this webinar, the timing of it actually is in the run up to two important um, meetings uh, that are coming up. Uh, they've been delayed due to the pandemic, but they will happen, I think. Uh, first, the Our Ocean Conference in Palau in April and then the second UN Ocean Conference in Portugal in June. And so these are um, gatherings that are considered you know, very important for the topics that were brought up today, the blue economy, IUU fishing. And I'm wondering, it's such arrangements when we have the opportunity to have many governments at the table, many stakeholders involved, different perspectives. What do you think should be prioritized in the coming months pertaining to the topics that you address? So for Fruduya Sensei, I would be interested to hear your thoughts on are you fishing or maritime security, if, if you'd like to take it more broadly, and then Andreas on the blue economy, where should we really get down into the nitty gritty details if we can um, and have some kind of follow up within these uh, multilateral contexts that are uh, fast approaching? Well, may I start? Uh, well, so uh, as I mentioned in, in a previous q and session, uh, well, I, I think the maintenance of rule-based order is very, very important. The international law provides uh, the norms, uh, you know, uh, that that is designed and planned for ideal, you know, the governance of oceans. And I, I found that the, you know, the today the presentation, two presentations are relating to, you know, the the the, the ocean space. That is not. Uh, governed by a single state, but multiple state or even the regional or international community. Now, what is ideal in the governance at sea? That, that, that is a question that we are, you know, that we academia need to approach. And my, you know, of course, this is not an easy question and there, there will be no instant, uh, you know, the answer to it. But, you know, the, the international law, the norms of the international law may provide the ideal distribution, ideal governance at sea. So in order to, you know, they realize that such, you know, the ideality, then uh, the states need to uh, discharge its obligation in order to enjoy its right under international law. And then if the state does not or cannot uh, fulfill the, the, uh, the obligation under international law, then such state need to ask the international cooperation to other nations so that you know as a regional approach or the, even the international community as a whole can uh, support such state to realize the ideal governance at sea that that, that is my you know uh, answer thank you very much thank you andreas yeah there's actually uh, not really much to add though I really just want to emphasize, you know, the, the the importance of the rule-based order, you know, in order to properly manage all this resource. And I think I'm not an expert on the topic at all, but what I find really interesting for the years ahead is deep at, uh, deep sea bed mining, you know, and really uh, a matter that, you know, uh, even pops up now in the Arctic, you know, about all the, the potential resources uh, uh, the ocean holds and at the bottom of the ocean holds. So I think uh, from a very practical um, perspective and the idea of, you know, a rule based order where countries come together and decide on, you know, uh, resources and matters outside their very own uh, ocean uh, jurisdiction. I think seabed uh, uh, mining is, is, is really a, a practical example that I think we, we need to focus more research on and also in the Arctic, you know, that you, you from time to time you read something, but um, uh, you don't really know when and where, uh, but um, I think, you know, starting early, as we've seen also again in the Arctic with the Central Arctic Ocean High Seas Fisheries Agreement, you know, where states came together before anything actually happens and agreed on like, okay, let's wait uh, for a couple of years before we do anything, you know, let's research, uh, you know, and, and science uh, do their work first and scientists do the work first. I think maybe from a practical perspective and again without being an expert on it at all, I think uh, deep sea uh, bed mining, well, sea bed mining, uh, is, is one of those practical uh, matters that I think needs some attention. Let's put it that way. Excellent. Thank you for that response. And now I would like to 
close our webinar and thank our speakers for their excellent presentations and insight into ocean governance, security and sustainability. And I would also like to thank them for accommodating the time difference between Oslo and Tokyo and also for our global audience for tuning in uh, to this webinar. As I mentioned previously, it will be available on Nupi's YouTube channel for future access, along with many other interesting webinars that are um, taking place every day here. And so I hope you can um, share this link with others that are interested in this topic. And I hope that we can also continue the conversation again soon, hopefully in person. But um, until then, please stay tuned and stay well. Thank you.